Father, we, we give you this morning. Lord, we pray that you would be blessed today. Lord, we pray that you would come and meet us here, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Receive our praise this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes, Lord, let us see all that you are, all that you need. Open our ears, Lord, let us hear all that you are, be loud and clear. Lord, please be near. As I pray.
continue to run into your throne room right now. God, as we've been singing, Lord, send your Holy Spirit. God, fill this place. God, we're choosing to praise you. Even if we don't feel like it right now, even if our, our week has not been that great, Lord, we're choosing to praise you because you are always worthy.
Thank you. We just want to keep praising your name. Father, we're very thankful today. And God, we can come and not have to, again, just come as we are and not have to cleanse ourselves or sacrifice or go through rituals, God. But we come boldly to your throne room, beaten and broken by the world, 
And God, you put us back together. So Father, we just want to keep praising your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Greer, and I want to welcome everybody who's joining us online. It's a privilege that you guys are here to worship today. I want to welcome everybody and encourage you to keep fighting the good fight because the Lord is at work, and regardless of what's going on in this world, 
we have victory in Christ, right? There's nothing going on in our lives right now that our relationship with the Lord does not give us what we need to overcome. I just want to encourage you. I didn't say that to first service. I walked up here and felt like God said to say that. So whoever that's for, everybody got to hear it for your encouragement. So hey, listen, next Sunday, we are going to wrap up our study in Second Peter and we are going to have a prophecy update next Sunday. We're going to talk about what the scriptures say about the days we're living in. We're going to talk about some of the signs of the times. And then we're going to move on to a new book of the Bible after that. But for today, we have a special guest. And I'm going to introduce him to you in just a moment. But before I do, I want to give you the backstory of why our special guest is here today. So in 2001, I was on staff in the Calvary in Albuquerque. And my primary role in that church was youth pastor. And before I came on staff, I worked a full-time career, and I was very involved and busy at the church. And the Lord gave Kelly and I a vision for our ministry to the youth, and it came from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. And I'm going to read that to you, and it'll be up on the screen the Apostle Paul says this. He says, Him we preach. Miles, can we get that verse up? Colossians chapter 1. Thank you, sir. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Him we preach, speaking of Jesus. And he says, Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Before I was on staff in the Calvary in Albuquerque, I was working a full-time career as a Toyota technician in a dealership, and I was very involved in the church. And from these verses, God gave us a vision for our ministry. Our job was to share the gospel with young people, and then to teach God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book, in a manner that led these youth to maturity. And it was exhausting because, again, working a full-time career and having what felt like a full-time ministry at the same time. And from this verse, God spoke to me, verse 29, where God said, if you will just do what I've called you to do, I will give you the strength and the energy to do it. And for so long, God sustained us and gave us strength and his provision and everything we needed. Well, then in 1998, I was invited to join the staff full-time I took on some extra responsibilities, and then God began to speak to us again about expanding our ministry. It was no longer just about leading kids to Christ and discipling them, but God spoke to us from two other portions of Scripture. The first, you know, we talk about it all the time. It's the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, and we'll read that together where Jesus is speaking to his disciples as he's about to ascend to the Father. Matthew writes these words. He says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And because of that, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So also the Lord spoke to us from Acts chapter 1, verse 8 which is in the same context of Jesus getting ready to ascend to his Father. And we read here, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And God gave Kelly and I a vision for missions with our youth, and we launched what we called Fishers of Men International Missions, and we started taking youth and young adults on mission trips. And our first really big successful trip was in 2001, we took a group of 15 youth and young adults into Dnipropetrovsk, Ukraine for 20 days. And it was life-changing for a lot of us, for a lot of young people. It was the turning point in their life. But the reason that we chose to go to Dnipropetrovsk is because we had a bigger vision than just taking kids on a mission trip and then coming home and just getting out of it what we were going to get. We wanted to make sure that if God worked through us, and people came to Christ or connections were made, that we could then hand those new believers or believers that were being encouraged to a pastor that would care for them and would continue loving them and 
making sure that they were discipled and such. And that's where Pastor Mike Pratt comes in. Where are you, Mike? Hi, Mike. So I met Mike over the internet because a missionary that we had sent from our church was working with Mike in Dnipropetrovsk. And we met over uh, phone calls. We met over emails. And so we flew into Kiev. We still had an overnight train ride ahead of us. 20 of us were just as exhausted as could be. But this is the face that greeted us, Mike. And we immediately became close friends and have continued to be very close friends. And many years that we took mission trips to Ukraine, we worked hand in hand with Mike and God worked mightily and a ministry relationship was birthed, a friendship was birthed. And um, today we've invited Mike to speak to you about life and missions in Ukraine and how that is currently impacting him and his family. And um, I want you to give a warm Calvary Chapel Greer welcome to my friend and brother, Pastor Mike Pratt. This is, this is one of the greatest friends that a man can have. <laughs> is that okay for mutual. the five bucks you gave me? Uh, yeah, I thought it was 50. Yeah, it was 50. You were supposed to give me 50, and I say nice things about you. Here's the green. <laughs> uh, it's uh, good to be here in Greer. Um, <clears throat> so my wife and I uh, moved to, to Ukraine in 1995 with our five children. Our youngest, Josh, was three months old. Uh, our oldest, Nicole, whom you've met, uh, she and her husband, Josh, we have two Joshes, uh, one by birth and the other by marriage. So <laughs> Josh and Nicole and their three children were here a couple months ago, I think, back in the fall, something like that, yeah. Uh, Nicole was 12 years old, and we started in Kiev. We've lived in Kiev, uh, the city of Dnipro, um, and now the city of Lviv. Lviv is, uh, well, Kiev's in the middle, Dnipro is southeastern Ukraine, and Lviv is uh, Western Ukraine, about an hour from the Polish border. Um, <clears throat> our lives have been very, very changed um, in many ways through all the years that we've lived there. And uh, it's been a very precious, wonderful time. Um, honestly, when we come back, I, I'm, I'm an American. I was born and raised in uh, Kokomo, Indiana, Michelle in Fort Wayne. Um, we're as American as apple pie, you know. We, and yet now there's such a strong part of Ukraine and Ukrainian culture and, and, and history that's, that's also shaped our lives. Um, it, it's just home. U Ukraine is home. Um, we will return to Ukraine on March the 12th, my wife Michelle and I. Um, and yeah, I'd like to share with you this morning... Uh, a little bit about what we're doing. And the church there sends their greetings. Uh, they met about seven hours ago. They should have. I should have checked up on them. Maybe they all went out to breakfast or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but they send their greetings, and we're very thankful for our partnership and ministry and prayer and love and just all the things that we have done over many, many years with Randy and the church here and uh, the youth and, and everyone. Um, <clears throat> a hair trigger is a metaphor. You think of it as he has a hair trigger temper. In other words, you know, it's like you don't want to look at that person the wrong way because if you do, boom, <laughs> he will explode. Hair trigger versus what trigger, meaning... Nothing triggers that person or a people or a group or something. The, 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 uh, those two extremes are important. And I'd like to share with you how that has shaped my life and our lives over the last year in Ukraine. 
Uh, one of the things that's happened, I'll get into the details of this shortly, but we, we have the church, but out of the church grew t- two ministries or two a- ways of serving uh, the people of Ukraine. The first one was a refugee shelter, which we, we started on day two of the invasion that began on February 24th. Uh, the other one is uh, an effort to rebuild homes that have been damaged or destroyed by the war and to provide trauma care for uh, families, children, adults who have experienced the war directly, which we all have, some more than others. Um, The card that you have, uh, it's a bookmark. Uh, You could use it to pray for us if you think of it. Um, Stick it in a book, your Bible or something, but there's a website there that you can take a look at. Not right now, but, uh, you know, after church or later this evening sometime. I'd like to show you a couple videos. Uh, People ask us, one of the questions I've been asked the most since being back in America, uh, we've been here for five weeks now, uh, Indiana, South Carolina, Indiana, Florida, South Carolina, and the California's next, um, is what's really happening in Ukraine. So that's what I'd like to share with you this morning and um, begin with a video. Uh, Miles, did I get, yeah? Uh, number one, the, uh, what's it called? The short one. Yeah. Yeah, if you could go ahead and play that now for This is our, uh, this is how the, the, the non-profit organization that we call NHUKR or New Horizons Ukraine got its start. So, go ahead. Hi, my name is Michael Pratt. My wife and I live in Western Ukraine. We've been here since 1995. On February 24th, our lives changed forever. Russian rockets and missiles and artillery were raining down on eastern Ukraine. Tanks were flowing across the border. And the people who lived there were terrified and fled to western Ukraine, where we live, to find shelter. We opened a a refugee shelter for the people in our basement office. We had 24 beds. On the second week of the war, A family came to us from eastern Ukraine. They had two little girls, Daria and Lisa. When they came in, our volunteer, Nastya, gave each girl a teddy bear to welcome them and make them feel at home. Nastya said, these these teddy bears are for you. You can take them with you when you go home. Daria said, we don't have a home anymore. They bombed it. Nastya responded to the girls and said, well, you can take them with you to your new home. And Daria looked at Nastya and said, no, we will take them with with us when we go back home and rebuild our home. From that story, the inspiration for our nonprofit organization, New Horizons Ukraine, NHUKR, was birthed in my heart. We have begun to build houses, rebuild houses that were damaged and destroyed by the war. And we also provide trauma care for families, children, Uh, elderly people, everyone who have been directly impacted by the war in Ukraine. We thank you for watching this video and we invite you to uh, to follow us on our webpage, in our social media, on Facebook. Thank you. After almost a year of fighting in Ukraine, our army has uh, driven back the Russian army we, we've recaptured or regained, reoccupied or deoccupied <laughs> uh, probably two-thirds of the land that the Russian army had occupied in the first four to five months of the war. So we're doing really, really well. Our army is fighting well. We are uh, winning. Uh, we are winning. Of course, it's a tremendous cost in lives. Um, our military, but also civilian lives. But thanks to the help of the United States um, and many other countries, our army is trained and equipped and continues to be trained and equipped with even more of the kind of um, weapons that we need to defend our nation and to um, drive the Russian army out and 
then we will have peace. Um, thank you all for that, because you all also send so much humanitarian aid. This church has done a lot, done, a, done so much. I met uh, Mark, one of the members here in Poland, back in, when was that, Mark? M March? I don't remember. I think he's here somewhere. Yeah. Uh, we met in Poland and uh, loaded up my car with humanitarian aid and drove it back in. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's another video here that I think really reflects where we live in Western Ukraine. <clears throat> we get air raid sirens. They, they average from the beginning, February 24th to today, there's probably been, I don't know, I would guess 1,200, maybe, maybe more air raid sirens. Uh, so that average is about two or three a day. So it, it's fluctuated here and there, but especially the first five months of the war, it was, it was uh, average two or three a day. Um, and in Ukraine, in Lviv, where, where we live, um, people would go to the air raid shelters uh, or take, take shelter in their home in um, a place where you're in an interior part of the house or apartment and surrounded by, you know, walls, no glass and all. Um, Lviv has been struck uh, probably 12 maybe more 12 to 15 times by cruise missiles where, where we live. But the video you're going to see next shows you um, a family from the city of Bakhmut, which you may have heard of if you, if you're, you know, watch the news a lot. Uh, Bakhmut was recently in the news because uh, there, was a, there was a battle that, that occurred there that's been lasting there for, I don't know, three months, four months. Um, I think that the population of the city before the, the battle occurred there, started there, was about 70,000. And um, unfortunately, uh, as of last week or uh, maybe two weeks ago, the Ukrainian army had to pull out of Bakhmut, and that's now occupied by the Russian army. Um, but to give you a sense of what it's like for other parts of Ukraine, where the fighting is, is intense and daily. Um, we took a story from a family, a uh, husband and wife and their daughter, I think she's eight years old, and give you a glimpse into what their life is like um, living in Eastern Ukraine, where the battle is raging every day. So Most families have escaped the violence here. Some families have chosen to stay behind. Eight-year-old Sonia is one of the last kids living in the center of the city. For nine months, she and her parents have been living under heavy and constant shelling. So this is Mama? Yes. This is your brother? This is Presa. Presa? Yes. This is me. Тут, короче, это я решила нарисовать family, да. uh, friends. Why do you keep water right here? Это, ну, это там папа говорил, чтобы удержать, там, чтобы окно там не разбилось. Но вообще она там раз помогла, э, был прилет, то есть э, окно только открылось, э, а эта бутылка задержала волны открывания. Вот так. Is that scary if that happens? Я боюсь то, что разбьют дом моих подруг. Их я их тогда вообще захочу вышвырнуть отсюда. Работаю в городе. Муж работает. У нас двое детей, двое сыновей взрослых и Соня. What do you tell Sonia about what's going on? Ну, она ребенок, понимаете? Она же должна жить более положительными эмоциями, чем мы. Поэтому я ее успокаиваю, говорю, что все это отстроится, мы все сделаем. Будет в городе гораздо лучше, чем было. 
Ну, стараемся ее поддерживать. Конечно, хотя сами, ну, очень тяжело это все переносим. Но... В ее классе было 33 или 34 человек, она одна. В городе осталась одна, все уехали. Конечно, очень страшно, конечно. Я бы не хотела, конечно, чтобы мой ребенок это все видел. Все это знал. Вся жизнь прошла в этом городе. То есть все у нас здесь, понимаете? Все родное, все здесь. То есть уезжать отсюда, это значит, это значит потерять себя. Пока есть силы, пока есть возможности, мы остаемся здесь. Очень тяжело будет. Невозможно. Если бы еще не, не стреляли вот это вот, целый день, слышите, что бог бог Ну, еще когда-то свыкли. Спускайся, Арчи. Спасибо, моя твоя история. Что это как жить здесь? Ну, в принципе, я уже привыкла так. Я уже так привыкла, то, что нам отключают. В принципе, я нахожу себе работу там. Теперь мне не с кем погулять, не с кем пообщаться там. Я поднимаюсь иногда и спрыгиваю. То есть, чудо там. Так. Молодцы, это у нас бак с водой. С водой там мама здесь моет посуду. Здесь еще у нас лежит пища. Там роллы всякие, суп роллы, острая лапша роллы, ну и батончики всякие. They've been coming here more and more as shelling increases around the city, doing everything they can to make it feel like home. So what is the first thing you're gonna do when the war's over? Я хочу пойти первое в парк видеть, услышать тишину, то есть. Ведь выстраивают новые дома там. В моей стране мне бы хотелось мира. Я бы хотела, чтобы был мир, чтобы все мои друзья были здесь, чтобы мы могли все вместе праздновать день рождения. Мы могли общаться, встречаться, ходить в школу, учиться. И ходить в эти бомбеубежища, которые нам сто лет не нужны. Но... My wife, Michelle, has lived in Poland and in Finland for about eight of the last 12 months, where she's been with uh, Nicole and Josh and our three grandchildren, uh, living as a refugee. I've been in Ukraine, in Lviv, um, helping and serving in different ways. Um, I, will, I did travel in and out from time to time, uh, spending some time with the family in Poland. And taking humanitarian aid and other kinds of aid uh, from Poland back into Ukraine and helping to see that that's been distributed. Um, 250,000 homes as of the last month have been destroyed or damaged uh, throughout Ukraine. That's homes or um, apartments. Apartments there are, m most of the time, they're, they're like condos where you own your apartment. So it's, you know, it's not like you're renting, although some people do that as well. But um, that, that number continues to grow because the war is continuing on. And we are expecting uh, an offensive, which some say has already started in the East. Um, which means the, the fighting and the destruction is set to, to grow even more. Um, how has all of this impacted us? One of the things that I knew already, <laughs> but was just reminded of even more during all of this time, is just how beautiful the Ukrainian people are how strong in character, how devoted, how never, ever, 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 ever give up. No matter what the cost is, we will continue. We will 
we will fight, we will win. And as Sonia said, she longs for the day when things can be rebuilt and life can be turned to normal. And as her mom said, that from all of this, we want to see Ukraine become even better than it was before it all started. The resilience the, of the Ukrainian people, the um, patriotism, the resolve. Uh, one thing I learned through all of this is if you take your phone and you turn on the flashlight and you fill a, a glass jar or a, uh, you know, something uh, with water and, and set it on top of that, it will, the light will illuminate you know, much like part of a room you know, because we have no power. On October 10th, uh, Russia began the campaign to destroy our infrastructure, meaning primarily our electricity and our ability to, to uh, create power, electricity, and distribute it to the country. Since that time, <clears throat> um, there have been attacks, cruise missile attacks, drone attacks, averaging well, one, every seven to 10 days, something like that, uh, since October 10th. We had our last one on Friday, uh, a couple days ago. Um, so they, they will fire 70 to 100 cruise missiles and drones at different cities throughout Ukraine, uh, primarily the, the larger cities. And the, the purpose is to deny us of electricity Therefore, no light, no water, no running water, um, no internet. It, it affects the cell phone system so that uh, you may have reception, but it, it's, it, it often doesn't work, even though it shows that you have reception. Um, and they're successful. Uh, we have rolling blackouts since October 10th. Um, a schedule has been established so that you'll have power for about four hours and then maybe two hours where you might have power, you might not. And then four hours where there's no power. After the strike, I was talking to our team and uh, family in Lviv on Saturday after the, the last strike. Um, and um, they said that it disrupted uh, the power so that they, they didn't have power for eight or ten hours, something like that, while they're trying to repair what's been damaged or destroyed. Um, so all of that, <clears throat> plus the air raid sirens, uh, plus the strikes, the missile strikes, it, it has such a deep impact on your life. And you can only imagine you just seeing and hearing about it, watching the videos, it's impacted you. But living there with it, it just begins to seep into your soul. Um, our first, our first um, missile strike in, Lv in Lviv was uh, f probably early March, second week of March. Um, Michelle was in Poland. Our son Josh, his wife Karina, the Ukrainian wife Karina, who is, was then pregnant for our grandbaby number nine, um, came to live with me in our house. Uh, we thought the location of our home on the edge of town, we thought it's probably the, one of the more safe areas to live in the event of a missile attack. Uh, we also had a couple of Ukrainians living with us who were refugees. And my daughter, our daughter, Lindsay, was also there. She came from California and brought some, some humanitarian aid and supplies and things. So we woke up that morning and, uh, to an air raid siren. And I was getting out of bed. Um, and I heard the first boom, uh, which I'd never heard before, um, a cruise missile strike. And it was close enough to the house that it, the, you could feel the, the concussion from it. It didn't, wasn't like window rattling kind of thing, but you could, there was a pressure wave there. And so I was immediately triggered and, and um, began to I run into the, the area of the house, you know, uh, the kids' bedrooms and, and were there. And just before I could even shout, uh, there was another strike, another boom. And I said, everybody get up, you know, and get downstairs. And, 
And it was, they moved fast. <laughs> yeah, we all got down, downstairs and went underneath the stairway, which is, was for us the safest part of the house. And then there was a third strike, and then the fourth strike, um, all within a matter of just minutes. And we were all terrified. We'd never heard anything like that before, experienced anything like that before. Um, <clears throat> once it was over and it was safe to come out, we went outside and you could see on the horizon, it was probably four or five miles from us. Um, the, um, the smoke that was rising where they, they targeted some infrastructure that supports the airport. Um, the, there were several more over the next coming weeks and months. Um, the one that got my attention the most was in March, April, probably April, May. I think it was in May. I was sitting at home. Michelle was still in Poland. Um, I was on a Zoom call uh, with my counselor. Uh, I have PTSD without the P. Looking forward to the day when it's post <laughs> because the war is over and we're living in peace. But uh, most of the people, everybody in Ukraine has been traumatized to different levels. Um, <clears throat> so I get some help with that, you know. And, uh, and the air raid siren went off. And, you know, after a while, you just begin to kind of get used to it all. Like Sonia said, you know, you just get used to it. And you adjust to it. It still, it, it impacts you, it affects you. Uh, but you just, you know, I'm not going to go underneath the stairs. I'm going to sit here and have my Zoom call. Um, one day, I, it was a beautiful day, and the air raid siren had gone off, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to go out in, the garage, out in the driveway and play basketball, see what I can see. You know, it's just, you just get used to it. So I was sitting there talking on this Zoom call, and suddenly I heard this whoosh, and Seconds afterwards, a huge explosion, and it was close. It was a window shattering, sh shaking, uh, wall shaking kind of explosion. And I immediately ran underneath the steps, of the, the stairway, um, and uh, there were some other explosions, secondary explosions at the same time. Um, some of them were our air raid defenses. Um, one of the things I've learned, it's amazing the things you learn and can learn. Like there's the sound, there's one sound that a cruise missile makes when it strikes a target. There's another sound that anti-air defenses make when they blow up a missile in, in, in flight. Two different sounds. And when you hear enough of that, you begin to say, you recognize it right away. Oh, that was our, we call it PPO, which stands for anti-air defense. Um, and, and so, you know, oh, that was the PPO. And of course, the thing, you know, the, the, the missile that was blown up mid-air and mid-flight has to fall somewhere, so you're not <laughs> safe. But uh, That strike was about a half mile from our house and one of the closest ones yet. So you think, you know, you think you're safe, but then you realize that you're not. <laughs> um, and, and life goes on and we just keep on living and keep on working. Um, our shelter opened on the second day of the war. We had 24 beds. You saw some in the first video, some images from our uh, from our shelter and the work that we did. Um, we helped 600, over 600 people uh, in those first four to five months. Uh, they would come in for a couple of days. Um, normally women with children, if dad was with them, uh, military age men are not allowed to leave Ukraine right now. And military age means up to age 60. Uh, you can get certain kinds of permissions uh, to be able to cross the border, but, but most men are not allowed to leave because uh, if they're not fighting, then men have to register so that at some point they may be called up so that they can uh, go active in the military and fight. And so one of the things that what was really, really hard to see is when you're at the border 
and you see a husband and his wife and, and his children walk up to the border and, and say goodbye. Because very often that wife and those children, they, they're going to Poland, but they don't know where. I mean, they don't, know, they don't have any place to go. 10% of all the refugees had nowhere to go. They didn't know anybody. They didn't know anything except, I have to get my family out of Ukraine. And so you see this husband and wife, you know, hugging and kiss goodbye, knowing that he's going to go back and be in the military, and will they ever see each other again? Just heartbreaking, heartbreaking things that traumatize us, all of us. So you have these triggers that develop, these things that, you know, um, like... Uh, when I'm very triggered by sounds. Another, another story. Um, it was September, one of my favorite months. It's my birthday month. But fall is my favorite time of year. My wife, Michelle, also. Uh, and so October begins the changing of the leaves in, in Ukraine. And just we just love it. It's just beautiful. The weather's nice. Um, September, about 70 degrees. The sky was blue. Um, we hadn't had an air raid siren yet that day. And uh, my friend Steve had come from Norway. He runs a nonprofit organization that works similar to ours, only they focus on children, helping children who've been, you know, traumatized by the war. Um, and we were having breakfast in the middle of Lviv. Now, Lviv, some, would, some have called it the Paris of the East because it's a small town, about 750,000 people. But uh, the center of it is all closed off to traffic, no cars. It's all cobblestone streets. The buildings are all, you know, two, three hundred years old. Beautiful old architecture. Cafes and restaurants and coffee shops and, and museums and just all kinds of, you know, fun little shops located in that, that area. And it's always, it's a big, big, tourism is big for us in Lviv. And so I go into Lviv, I just love it down there. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there having breakfast with Steve, you know, and we're enjoying our coffee and good to see him again. And, and, um, and then I hear a boom and immediately I'm triggered. I'm, you know, I know I'm, I'm vulnerable. We're on the second floor of this building um, and, and I'm listening, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, what's next? What do I do, you know? And then just seconds later, another boom and while this is going on, Steve's sitting there and eating his eggs. You know, he's like, oh, boy, Mike, aren't these eggs good? Man, this is great, you know, and the coffee's good, you know, and I'm, I'm like this. And after the second one, I looked at Steve, and he looked at me, and he said, what's wrong? And I said, didn't you hear that? No, hear what? Um, and then the third one. Boom! Another one. Now, in my mind, I thought, oh, my God. Oh, somehow they figured out a way to disable our air defense system and our radar system so that we just got struck three times and, and what else is coming? Our, our army, this is important. In the early days and weeks of the war, the invasion, our army was not very well equipped not very well trained, not very well supplied with what we needed to defend ourselves. And that includes our air defense systems. And so in those early days, uh, our air defense would try to shoot down these cruise missiles and drones and things, and they weren't always real successful. You know, we had a lot of strikes in those early days. But then as the United States and Europe and other countries began to supply us with more and more weapons, especially air defense weapons, our, and as we practiced, as our guys, unfortunately, have got a lot of practice, uh, but they became better and better and better at shooting missiles out of the sky. So that now the average is about 80 to 85% is, is what our army is able to knock out of the sky. So um, the strikes are much, much fewer. But on that September day, I thought, you know, they've somehow defeated all that. And um, <clears throat> after the third boom, 
Steve, uh, he, he said to me, Mike, maybe you shouldn't be here. <laughs> Uh, because it shook me that much. Now, it's interesting because when I came to to the United States, Michelle and I came to the United States five weeks ago. Uh, still, there's sounds that that trigger me, but the response, my reaction, is uh, smaller, uh, not as strong, not as I hear it like this morning during the message in the first service, there was a, is there a train track, I think, back here. So there was a train. And it's not exactly the same, but there's, there's some uh, sounds in that train going by that sound like a missile. <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, and I know I'm safe. Now, here's the point, and if... Uh, Miles, did I get that right? Yes, I remembered. Uh, could you put that verse in Colossians back up on the board, please? And if you would, let's turn to uh, Psalms, the book of, uh, yeah, Psalm. We want to look at Psalm 137. Because this is how... Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, not, um, it's not Psalm 137, it is nope, that's not it, uh, thank you, sorry, thank you, 139, I got about three hours sleep last night. <laughs> That's another thing that the PTSD has been doing to me. I don't sleep very well. Psalm 139. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Verse 7. And let this be our prayer today. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold... You are there. If I take up the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will take hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Lord, help us to be aware of your presence here today, right now, and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. So after that little incident in the cafe, I, I thought a lot about that. And there's, there's four things that are a part of my life, a regular part of my uh, routine, my rhythm, my, you know, my relationship with God that I, I really focus on a lot. I, I, use, I, I use it as to, to guide my, my devotional time with God in the Word. Um, I use it to help me understand and see the work of the Holy Spirit in events that happen, in devotional. I, I read Oswald uh, Chambers' devotional. Uh, my atmosphere is highest. I love it. And I use this as I go through there. But these four words are read, reflect, respond, and rest. And they're really important because, for instance, that day at that cafe, Steve's eating away and, and I'm being triggered. You know, and I was so, over the next week or two, I was praying about that. I said, Lord, what's the message in there? What's the lesson? What can I learn from that? So that's reading. That's looking at things and being aware and, and asking God to help you see what you don't see. You know, like Steve, learning to see what he didn't see, the sound of that boom. Which, by the way, um, when a dump truck raises, it's got a load full in its bed, you know, and it raises the bed and then trips the gate for the, the, uh, the tailgate and all the load goes <laughs> out and when everything's out and he starts to lower that again, the tailgate's just like this and it hits the body of the truck and goes boom and that sounds exactly like a cruise missile strike. 
from a distance. That's why I was so triggered. But it wasn't what I thought it was. And so in your life, in our lives, so often things come into life, into your daily life, and you think it means one thing, or you think you should respond one way, or you do respond one way, but then upon further reflection and awareness, you realize, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have said what I said, you know? Or maybe I shouldn't have made that decision. Or maybe it's just the opposite. Maybe you, like the psalm says, you in the darkness discovered the light. But it takes awareness, the ability to, to read the situation. You're paying attention. It's got all of your attention. You have to slow down to do that. That's where the rest comes. It's learning to wait and slow down. And then the reflection is learning to slow down and say, Lord, what's going on here? And so in that situation with Steve and breakfast and the three booms, I was asking the Holy Spirit, um, what's there for me? What do, you, what do you want to say to me through this? And the Holy Spirit said, well, Mike, um, I want you to be so triggered by me, by the Spirit of God, who even in the darkest, most blackest, most unfair, just terrible times in life, you're not alone. And Mike, how often do you, in the midst of that, and the suffering, the hardship is still there. It doesn't go away. Um, you know, I'm sitting in our bathroom bomb shelter, which I made several videos of um, while the air raid's going off, and Michelle's in Poland, and the power's all off, and she's, she's getting, we get these notifications on our phone. It's, it's really... Ukrainian people are just so amazing. We have this uh, app or, on our phone, and as soon as there's bombers in the air, in the north, in the east, or in the south, our radar picks it up, and we are warned. Bombers in the air. It's right on our phone. Bombers in the air. And, and then if, there's an, if they launch a missile, a cruise missile, either, whether it's from the ground, from the air, or from the sea, immediately it's detected. Immediately. And they tell us on, a, on the app, okay, 42 missiles launched from the Azov Sea. And they're this kind of missile, and they're headed on this tra tra trajectory. Um, and so, you know, people in these areas, be careful. And then as it gets close to the area, you know, specific areas, then the air raid siren is triggered. And, and so, and, and then it tells us where there's a strike. It tells us where the PPO, the anti-air defense, has knocked things down. Um, and so we have all this information available to us. One of the things I've learned, so this is an example of something that God wants to teach you or bring out in you, help you respond in some way that you've never ever even thought about. You know, it's like a brand new discovery, maybe of some part of who God is and how God wants to work in your life. Or maybe it's the answer to a question you have, some direction in life. One thing that I've, I've learned, uh, and I, I like the saying, I read this a couple weeks ago, is that God cannot steer a parked car. You know, so often in life, we get to, to, to you know, a, situ a, a time in life where our life is really like a parked car. We got the emergency brake on, you know. And God is speaking to us, but because we've got so much going on or, you know, so focused on the wrong things or so overcome by trauma that you can't respond. You know, you're parked and God's trying to steer you. But, and so what I learned is that when our closest border to Russian territory, Belarusian, uh, is the north of us. And when a, a cruise missile is launched from Belarus towards Lviv, it takes 15 to 20 minutes to get to us, which means, and the, and the air raid siren goes off right away, which means I've got 15 or 20 minutes that I can keep playing basketball, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And my wife says, get in the 
get in the shelter, <laughs> get under the stairs. <laughs> but the things that you learn that you never would have thought you learned, I, I, I would have never guessed that this little country boy from Kokomo, Indiana would learn something like that. What does God want to teach you individually, together in your family? And what is important to know is that you're not alone. Whether you're at you know, the top of a mountain or the deepest part of the sea, the, the darkest part of life, you're not alone. The Holy Spirit is with you. And so you can use this, and there's other ways to do this. You, you read, uh, you reflect, you think about it, you pray about it, you, Holy Spirit, and you take your time. You know, maybe it's going to be a matter of days or weeks or even months where you're praying about this thing that's got your attention. That's the key. What has your attention? When I read the scriptures, I, I read small sections. Now, there's lots of ways to read the scriptures. All of them are good. All of them are important. But the way I do that so that I can discern what the Holy Spirit is speaking to me is read small sections of scripture. And I'll read it once, and then I'll prayerfully ask the Lord, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you, what do you want to say to me in here? And I'll look for what gets my attention as I read it the second time. And I'll read it slowly, really slowly. And then sometimes even a third time. And then I'll just sit in silence and wait and pray. And I'll listen to the Holy Spirit. What, what, has, my, what, what has my attention? What are you trying to point me to? That's how the Holy Spirit triggers our lives. That's how we can learn to recognize his presence. The verse that Randy shared with us, him we preach, wishing, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Perfect. Perfect doesn't mean sinless perfection. Perfect means perfectly trained. Well trained to discern, to listen, to see, to recognize the Holy Spirit's working here. To, to walk into a situation in life where, you know, you know walking into it, this is a toxic situation. You know, the person or people that I'm going to be having to interact with here, this is going to be tough. And walk into it aware of that. Holy Spirit, give me strength, you know to deal with darkness. Uh, perfect in Christ Jesus. Well trained. And that training, the beauty of this is it all revolves around relationship. Relationship with God, which is new every morning, every day, throughout our day, it's always something new, some new way that the, that the Lord is revealing himself, is speaking, to, revealing himself through you. Last time I was, I think it was the last time we were in Greer, I was in a, a, a supermarket. And I was walking down the aisles getting stuff because we want to take it back to Ukraine with us. Um, and um, it was mole sauce, yeah, for Mexican chili. That's something I learned from Randy. Yeah. <laughs> They came and, and they said, do you ever hear of New Mexico chili? I said, no. He said, let me, make, let me make you some. He made us New Mexico chili. Oh, man. You've got to have mole. Uh, anyway. So I'm looking for this. And I see this woman. She's, you know, and we see each other and exchange, you know, hi and like everybody does in America, which is great. Um, but then I got up to the checkout to, to check out. And she was in front of me. She got through and she turned around and she looked at me and she said, what is it about you? So there's just something peaceful about you. I've never experienced that with someone just looking at you. And it's like, me? <laughs> and then she turned and walked off and I thought, it's the Lord. Even when we don't realize God's presence is with us and in us and operating, he is. So read, reflect, respond, and rest. Rest means 
It doesn't mean not working. It means resting in the finished work of God in our lives. He has given you everything, everything you need for life and godliness. Everything. There's nothing lacking. He has given you and all of us everything we need to learn to perfect those disciplines of life that help us to be triggered by the Holy Spirit and not by the fleshly things. Um, and rest. I guess that's it. Uh, rest in God's love. Rest in God's grace. Peace is going to come to Ukraine and we will rebuild. And thank you for your help and the ways that you're involved. If you'd like more information about our nonprofit organization, you can go to the website. There's... Um, get more information. If you're here and life is really, really dark, <laughs> um, I'll be around for a while. We can talk. I don't have the answers, but together we can point ourselves to the Holy Spirit who is working. So be encouraged. Father, the victory is ours. There are times when it doesn't look that way. <laughs> Man, there's times when just, yeah, things look so bleak. And the cost is so high. But the victory is ours. Because you, you gave us the victory through Christ, crucified and risen who's with us today. We're never alone. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for this church. Ask your blessings, the outpouring of your spirit, just being stirred up, stirred up more and more and more as you are already operating and working here and producing good fruit. Bless this body, Father. Thank you for them all. Help us all, God, to be so sensitive to your spirit and when we're not to give ourselves a break and receive your grace <laughs> and your love in Jesus name amen. amen hang out for a minute Mike if you regularly give here at Calvary Greer um, you're already supporting the work that Mike and Michelle and their team are doing there in Ukraine and then not only supporting them on a regular basis, but when we hear of a need or when a special project comes up that we get involved with in a church and we support that, um, that comes out of the giving that you've given here at Calvary Greer also. Mike mentioned that they started a nonprofit and that's outside of the church and the goal of that organization is to help people rebuild their lives. So they want to rebuild spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Absolutely. All and of so mm -hmm. the church is one leg of Mike's ministry and the nonprofit is another leg. And the way you would get involved if you mm -hmm. wanted to get more information about the nonprofit is simply this Bible bookmark that was on your seat. You can follow the link here and get more information, but uh, that's kind of impersonal. What I suggest is that you guys just swarm Mike's table back there <laughs> at the end of the service now. Mm -hmm and uh, ask him lots of questions of how you can bless them there and the work that they're doing. So can we pray for Mike and Michelle and his ministry real quick? Michelle, run up here. Alex, why don't you and Rachel run up here? You all know Alex, our son. Some of you may be just making the connection. This is Alex's dad and mom. <clears throat> I just want to pray over these guys and the work that God's going to continue to do through them and to bless them for their faithfulness and their obedience. So Lord, I just thank you for Mike and Michelle 
Lord, all of these years serving in Ukraine, Lord, they've, they've borne a lot of fruit. There's a lot of people who have both heard the gospel and been well-trained under their leadership. And Lord, many of those sheep that they have had in their fold over many years are now scattered because of the war, because of the unrest. And that's hard for a pastor and a pastor's wife to see the flock scattered. And that comes with, it, with its own set of uh, hurts and concerns. And Lord, really, you're the only one who can completely understand and minister to that. So we pray for these two, Lord. And we pray for the people that they have trained up well, that have now been sent out, and they're sharing Christ in other places. Lord, protect them and bless them. And I know that these two are praying about some big decisions. We pray, God, that you would lead and guide them as they're deciding about their return to Ukraine and what Michelle will do and what the work will look like and what the future will look like, Lord. And as Mike said, Lord, uh, it's easy for you to steer a moving vessel, but not a parked vessel. So, Lord, as they're continuing to move, lead and guide them, bless them. And I know it's hard for Alex and Rachel, Lord, to be here while they're seeing their family uh, in a very insecure place. So just give Alex and Rachel peace and Lord, just bless this family for the way they've served you. And Lord, my final prayer is for this church. Today we've been challenged and there's people in this room, Lord, that, that heard your word today and what they've been mobilized to do is to reach out to their Jerusalem and their Judea. But others in here, Lord, they've been prompted to get involved in a bigger way. Uh, big outreaches or trips to foreign countries to share the gospel and to undergird the work that others are doing there. Lord, don't let today have been just a morning where we sit and hear a story and then go out of here. Let this be a day, Lord, where each of our hearts has been challenged and we are ready to take our personal relationship with you and our service to you to a new level, Lord. At the leading of the Spirit, we just pray for lots of blessing, Lord be with all these guys in Jesus name and everybody said amen, amen. So my... there's nothing worth more that can ever come close nothing can compare you are living home your presence Tasted and seen who the sweetest of loves, who my heart becomes free, and my shame is earned.